Hi guys, just waiting for more people to join. Hi there. I'm just going to wait a few more minutes to see if people would like to join. In the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Hello there, welcome. This is our first go with Facebook, so I'm not actually sure how many people will join. I'm just going to give it a couple more minutes to see if anyone else would like to attend. Um, in the meantime, thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Dr. Chelsea Roshib. I am the head sleep specialist at Westfer. Um, and I'm just going to talk about some of the common symptoms of sleep apnea, including some of the more obvious symptoms that most people are aware of and some of the not so obvious symptoms. So if you have sleep apnea or you think you might have sleep apnea, um, this might be able to help you determine whether or not you should go through the testing process to get evaluated and diagnosed with the sleep breathing disorder. Um, if you have any specific questions not related to this topic, that's fine as well. I'm happy to answer whatever questions you have. Um, my specialty is in sleep disorders and the science of sleep. Um, so even if you have a question not related to sleep apnea, I'm happy to answer that as well. Yes, I can, I can definitely discuss the difference between obstructive and central apnea. So I'm happy to answer that right now, actually. So um, there's two primary types of sleep apnea. There is obstructive sleep apnea, which is by far the most common type of sleep apnea. And there's central sleep apnea, which 
Um, it's not super rare, but we don't see it as much as we see obstructive sleep apnea. So to give you a general overview of what we mean by sleep apnea, we mean that um, if you have sleep apnea, whether it's obstructive or central sleep apnea, you stop breathing periodically throughout the night while you're asleep. And if you do this enough times, your oxygen levels will drop and you'll go into a state of low oxygen called hypoxia, and that's very detrimental to your health. So obstructive sleep apnea is specifically caused by an obstruction in the upper airways. So the throat, um, sometimes your nasal passage. Um, so when you're falling asleep or when you're sleeping, um, what generally happens is you lose tone in your muscles and the tissues in your throat relax a little bit too much and that can obstruct air from entering your nose on your mouth and entering your lungs. Now, central sleep apnea is a little bit different. So central sleep apnea is not caused by an obstruction in the upper airways. It's caused by a, a number of things, but the main reason is that your brain essentially forgets to tell your body to breathe. Um, so those, those signals that are supposed to come from the area of your brain, specifically your brain stem that keeps you breathing consistently throughout the night, just do not make it to your chest and your lungs and you can stop breathing periodically. Now, obstructive sleep apnea is more, mostly a physical issue. So um, it can be due to being overweight. You have, you know, fat deposits around your neck, which can cause overcrowding and tissue collapse. Um, it can also be due to some physical features, such as having a really narrow airway or something like very large tonsils or a very large tongue. Whereas central sleep apnea is more of a neurological issue um, and it can be due to a variety of reasons such as a neurological disorder, um, a brain injury, um, certain neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease or dementia or Parkinson's disease. Um, it can also be related to various cardiovascular conditions. Um, it happens quite a bit in people who are uh, quadriplegics, paralyzed, um, and there's a large range of other things that can cause central sleep apneas. Um, we typically see it in people who drink a lot of alcohol because alcohol, as you know, depresses the nervous system, and that makes it harder for your brain to send those signals to your body to breathe. Um, other things which can depress the nervous system uh, would be like opiate medications, and other substances that people might abuse. So that's the main difference. Um, you can either have obstructive sleep apnea, you can have central sleep apnea, or you can have a combination of both. Um, now, like I said, obstructive is by far the most common type of sleep apnea, and it is becoming more common in America. Central, it, you know, there's a, there's a good chunk of people who have central sleep apnea, but it's not nearly as much as obstructive and even less so to have both of those types of sleep apnea at the same time. So let me just check the questions here. No, uh, that's a great question. Um, what is a critical O2 threshold? So what we say is your blood oxygen saturation levels should be at around 95%. Um, when you start dipping be below 95%, uh, that's a bit problematic. Um, it becomes very problematic when you start dipping below 90%. Um, so people with, you know, moderate to severe sleep apnea will have a, you know, it will be very typical for their blood oxygen levels to kind of go up and down throughout the night. And it would not be abnormal to see them dipping into the 80s consistently. Now, people with the most severe sleep apnea can even go lower than that. And that's when it starts getting very critical. So those periods of intermittent hypoxia, as we call them, where blood oxygen is constantly going up and down, that causes a lot of stress on the cardiovascular system. And when you have chronic long-term sleep apnea, this constant up and down hypoxia every night 
all night um, can lead to things like high blood pressure um, and various types of cardiovascular disease. Now, it can also raise your risk for other diseases like diabetes, cancer, um, several uh, neurological conditions like Alzheimer's disease, for instance, and dementia. Um, but we, you know, we usually see um, a blood pressure spike first, and then it kind of snowballs from there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start getting into today's topic, which is I'm going to discuss um, all, well, the main symptoms of sleep apnea. I'm going to talk about the obvious symptoms that people probably already know about. And these are symptoms, if you have sleep apnea, you've probably recognized in yourself. And I'm also going to talk about some not so obvious symptoms that people don't usually equate with sleep apnea. Um, so I'm going to specifically be talking about obstructive sleep apnea, but that's not to say that these symptoms don't also equate to central sleep apnea. So there's a lot of overlap in symptoms, and I'll kind of talk about which ones you would expect to see overlapping in both obstructive and central. Okay, so the very first obvious symptom that everyone is aware of is excessive daytime sleepiness. So sleep apnea causes sleep deprivation, even if you're not aware of it. And the way sleep apnea causes sleep deprivation is every single time you stop breathing and your oxygen levels go down and your carbon dioxide levels go up in your blood, your brain can sense that. So your brain is constantly monitoring your oxygen versus carbon dioxide levels. And if your oxygen levels go down too far, your brain will trigger you to automatically wake up, even if it's just for a few seconds, so that you can recommence breathing and get your, get your oxygen levels back to normal. So a lot of times people with sleep apnea don't even realize they're, wake, you know, they're waking up because it's so brief. We call these micro awakenings. And what that does is it's constantly keeping you in this state of really light sleep and you're on a hair trigger to wake up. So you're never really cycling into those deeper, more restorative stages of sleep. So ultimately, you know, somebody with sleep apnea can sleep for, you know, 10, 11, 12 hours, but still feel tired the next day because they really didn't get much of that restorative deep sleep that they actually need to feel well rested the next day. So first obvious is sleepiness. Okay, well, let's talk about a not so obvious symptom. Um, so this is a big one and people never really associate it with sleep apnea, but increased nighttime urination. Now, you, if you have sleep apnea, you may have noticed that you're going to the bathroom more frequently at night than you used to. And there's a reason for this. So when you have sleep apnea and your oxygen levels are going up and down all night long, it changes the way the blood flows through the body, and that includes how the blood flows to the kidneys. So hypoxia, the, the action of blood oxygen levels dropping, will change the way of how blood flows to your organs and especially the kidneys. Now, when blood flow volume changes to the kidneys, that also changes the way our kidneys filter waste products, so specifically urine. And so what's happening is your kidneys should be shut down at night. Um, so we release hormones called antidiuretic hormone that's supposed to keep us from having to go to the bathroom all night. This is so we are not constantly waking up and urinating. However, um, sleep apnea increases the urine output through the kidneys and it also changes the balance of that hormone so your kidneys don't know that they need to slow down filtering throughout the night. The other thing is that if you're constantly waking up throughout the night because you have sleep apnea and it's triggering you to wake up, you're going to notice more often that you need to relieve yourself. So you become more sensitive to the urine in your bladder that you would normally be. So increased nighttime urination is one of the bigger, not so obvious signs of sleep apnea. Okay, let me just check some questions. 
Okay, Bob just asked, should somebody use a CPAP or somebody who is using a CPAP also use a pulse oximeter to cross check the CPAP's effectiveness? Um, yes, you can. Actually, I usually recommend to my clients that um, you know you own a pulse oximeter. Um, you can get them very cheap now. It's not expensive, and to test yourself every so often, um, because you know CPAP is very effective. But if you're still having symptoms of your sleep apnea, such as you're still waking up feeling really groggy, or you know you feel like you're waking up and gasping for air, or you're having any of the symptoms that I'm about to list here, then using a pulse ox is a really good way to check to see that your CPAP is actually stabilizing your blood oxygen levels. So when you use a pulse ox, you should specifically be looking at your oxygenation percentage. So you're looking to see that your blood oxygen levels are staying around 95%. If you see that your blood oxygen levels dip momentarily, um, you know, into the lower 90s or the 80s, then there may be an issue with your CPAP and you may need your levels adjusted. So I always recommend that. And it's also a really good way to gauge how severe your sleep apnea is, a, is as well, um, because the severity of sleep apnea can range from very mild to so severe that it's, it's quite dangerous. Okay, we will jump over to the next obvious symptom of sleep apnea. Uh, so this one is actually going to, um, so I should say that sleepiness and nighttime urination, um, you also see that with central sleep apnea as well. So that crosses over. So the next one is waking up gasping for air or waking up feeling like you have to catch your breath. And this goes back to, you know, sleep apnea making you momentarily stop breathing throughout the night. Now, some people have what we call uh, apnea clusters where they'll have one event right after another. So they'll, they'll stop breathing, um, their brain will trigger them to breathe again, and then they'll quickly go back to not breathing. And this causes a very dramatic decrease in your blood oxygen levels. I like to explain it kind of like drowning. Um, imagine yourself in the middle of the ocean, there's nobody around you, you're stranded, and you've been treading water and your head is bobbing up and down above the water. You're just trying to keep your head above water so that you can breathe. So your head, an apnea is like your head going underwater, and then you come up and try to breathe as much as you can, but your head just gets pushed right back down underwater. So when you're having those consecutive apneas, um, when you do wake up because your brain wants you to breathe again, you will very likely feel like you're out of breath or um, you might gasp for air. So it's very common for people or people's partners to notice that the individual with sleep apnea is gasping. So. Okay. And I will say that oftentimes um, the first person to notice these symptoms is often not the person with sleep apnea, but usually the partner in bed with the person who has sleep apnea. Okay. So gasping, we did sleepiness, nighttime urination, gasping for air. Let's move on to another not so obvious symptom of sleep apnea. So this may seem counterintuitive, but insomnia is also a not so obvious symptom of sleep apnea. So most people think sleep apnea just makes me tired. I want to sleep all the time. How could I possibly have insomnia when, you know, during the day I'm falling asleep at lunch or in my car when I'm working? But the reason sleep apnea can trigger insomnia is because it really messes with your sleep cycle and it's also waking you up continuously during the night. So going back to how the brain is constantly detecting your oxygen levels, and if your oxygen levels drop below a certain threshold, your brain is gonna trigger you to wake up so that you can recommence breathing. Well, for a lot of people, when we wake up, when apnea makes us wake up, we then find it very difficult to fall back to sleep again. This is called maintenance insomnia. So a lot of people with sleep apnea will wake up many times during the night and every time they wake up during the night, they find it very difficult to fall back to sleep. 
And I see a ton of people who come to me and assume they actually just have insomnia when in reality it's their sleep ap or their sleep apnea that's causing all of the problems. So insomnia. Oops. Okay. All right, let me just have a check for questions and comments. Any questions you guys have? Do you trust the Pulse Ox on the Apple Watches? Um, they're okay, but they're never going to be as good as the clinical FDA approved Pulse Oxes. Um, I recommend looking for a specific, so a Pulse Ox only that's FDA approved. Um, so this would be a device that is only a Pulse Ox and doesn't do anything else. Um, so Apple Watches are pretty accurate, but they're not going to be perfectly accurate. And um, basic Pulse Oxes are very cheap. Um, so it's actually more cost effective for you to get a Pulse Ox than an Apple Watch. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next one. Okay, so another obvious symptom of sleep apnea is going to be sore throat or dry mouth in the morning. Um, and this is for obvious reasons. So when people have sleep apnea, they really struggle to get air into their lungs, specifically obstructive sleep apnea. And they also tend to breathe through their mouth. Um, so it's very common for patients with sleep apnea to be mouth breathers. And if you can imagine, every time you gasp for air or struggle to breathe, it puts a lot of pressure on your throat. So if you can imagine going like this several times a night, <gasps> that puts a lot of strain and really irritates your throat. And so especially people with moderate to severe sleep apnea, it's pretty common to wake up in the morning with a sore throat. And then dry mouth goes back to the fact that many people with sleep apnea breathe through their mouth. Um, so you'll find that, you know, you may have that combination of sore throat, dry mouth in the morning. Okay, we'll go on to a not so obvious symptom. So this one may be a little bit obvious. I think a lot of people are starting to become more aware of this symptom as sleep apnea gets more coverage in the media, um, and that is high blood pressure. So if you've had sleep apnea for a while and it's been untreated, one of the first effects that we see on your body besides, you know, the mental effects of being sleep deprived is changes in your cardiovascular system. Um, so one of the very earliest changes in your cardiovascular system that would make us worry a little bit that your sleep apnea is causing problems is an elevation in your blood pressure. Um, so if you've gone to the hospital or seen your doctor and you notice that your blood pressure was slightly elevated, one of the first things your doctors will usually check with is to kind of determine if you have sleep problems because sleep apnea and blood pressure go hand in hand. Um, and what will happen is the longer you go untreated with sleep apnea, the worse the effects on your cardiovascular system will be you know, become. Um, so we always see high blood pressure first and then it can snowball from there. Um, so it's not uncommon for people in their 60s, 70s and 80s who have had lifelong sleep apnea to go on and develop a full blown cardiovascular disease. And um, cardiovascular disease and sleep apnea are so common that um, cardiovascular specialists now are starting to um, prescribe sleep studies for most of their patients. Um, that's how common the two diseases are together. Okay, just check the questions really quick. I only got dry mouth from CPAP machine, so I had to get the humidifier in, which now makes my mask fill with water. Yeah, that's one of the unfortunate things about using CPAP is it, that's a common complaint is 
because it is essentially forcing pressurized air through the mask into your throat, it can cause dry mouth. Um, the humidifiers are good as long as you're using them correctly. So, you know, it's essential that you only use distilled water, not tap water. And sometimes you have to play around with your settings to figure out what the best setting is for you. Um, if you're finding that your mask is filling up with water, your setting might be too high. So you might just need to adjust it down. Um, alternatively, you can try different types of masks. So that tends to be a pretty common problem with the full masks. So the ones that go over your nose and your mouth, but the nasal pillows and the nasal masks can have, you know, that can be less of an issue. And so if the humidity is, you know, causing water to build up on the inside of your mask, definitely talk to your doctor or your sleep technician about ways that, you know, you can adjust the settings or, you know, talk to them about getting a different type of mask. Okay. So next obvious symptom is snoring. So I think most people know that there is a correlation between the severity of your snoring and having sleep apnea. So many research studies have found, and sleep apnea is an extremely well-researched area in medical science, that the more severe your snoring, the more likely you are to have sleep apnea, and also the more intense your snoring. And when I mean intense, I mean loud, almost freight train-like. The more intense your snoring, usually the more severe your sleep apnea. So sleep apnea and snoring often go hand in hand. Now, that does not mean that people who snore always have sleep apnea. And that does not mean that people who have sleep apnea always snore. There are exceptions, but there's also a lot of overlap. But the good thing is sleep apnea treatments almost always improve snoring as well. So you're killing two birds with one stone. Okay, let's move on to another not so obvious symptom, and that is poor oral hygiene. And what I mean by poor oral hygiene is I mean issues with your teeth. So things like cavities, tooth decay, things like that. And the reason for this is going back to the fact that a lot of people with sleep apnea also breathe through their mouth. And you may know that in oral hygiene, mouth breathing is, you know, has a very negative effect because it causes mouth dryness and it causes things like increased buildup of that bacteria that can cause cavities. So the two are very correlated. And because a lot of dentists actually work on sleep apnea now, people who are coming in for oral hygiene problems um, their dentist is also noticing that they may have sleep apnea as well. So a lot of dentists are now diagnosing people with having sleep apnea first based off of their oral hygiene. I'll just put mouth issues. So if you have a tendency to get cavities or tooth decay, you know, you may want to talk to your dentist about evaluating whether they think that you might have sleep apnea. Okay, let me just check. Why are more people not using the O2 ring vibration mode for biofeedback to adjust your sleeping position? That's a good question. So I, I don't know how I feel about the vibrating biofeedback because in theory, it works, but it also wakes people up very frequently. So, I mean, yes, it is telling you to change your position and, you know, get off your back, which tends to make uh, obstructive sleep apnea symptoms worse. But if it's also going off constantly throughout the night, you know, even when your oxygen levels are dipping a little bit, it's going to also be quite detrimental to your sleep. Um, people are more than welcome to use that and if it works for them, great. But usually I recommend just trying a positional therapy device like a wedge pillow or, you know, sewing a ball into a t-shirt, for instance, before trying those. But again, 
everyone's different. Everyone responds to these devices differently. So, you know, if it works for you, that's great. If it doesn't, there are other options. Okay. Another obvious symptom of obstructive sleep apnea, um, or actually both uh, uh, obstructive and central, is a morning headache. And so people with sleep apnea tend to wake up with a headache that kind of goes away as the day progresses. Um, and the reason for this, again, goes back to those oxygen dips. So when you have oxygen desaturations, it puts a lot of stress on your cardiovascular system. And that constant changing of blood flow through all of your vessels can affect your head and give you a headache. So it's very, very common for people with both types of sleep apnea to have a mild to moderate headache that goes away after an hour or two when they wake up. Okay. Yeah, morning headaches are not normal. So if you are experiencing a morning headache, it may be related to your sleep apnea. Um, obviously there's other things that can cause morning headaches as well, but that's one of the more common symptoms. Okay. Let's move on to another not so obvious. So this one is a big one and it, it feels intuitive, but um, a lot of people don't make the connection and that is mental health issues. So first and foremost, sleep apnea, both types, um, obstructive and central sleep apnea, they really affect your ability to get that deep restorative sleep that you need. And science has very clearly shown that when you are not getting enough good, high quality sleep, one of the first things that can happen is you can, you know, develop mental health issues. Um, when I talk about mental health issues, I mainly am talking about mood disorders. So things like depression and anxiety. However, sleep loss can affect every single type of mental health condition, especially if that condition is pre-existing. Um, so it can make you develop depression or anxiety symptoms, or if you already have depression and anxiety, it can make those mental health disorders worse. And so there's a big connection. And there was a huge study several years ago that looked at thousands of people, and they found that people with sleep apnea um, are significantly more likely, so I'm talking up to 50% to 60% more likely to have either anxiety or depression. So if you find that your mood has really shifted and you find that you're, you know, feeling more chronically depressed than usual, you know, looking at the quality of your sleep and investigating whether or not you might have a sleep disorder is really important. I would also like to point out that that's pretty common for most sleep disorders, not just sleep apnea. So it's something to keep an eye on. Okay. Just check the questions really quick. Okay, and then I added a bonus number six for not so obvious because I thought this one was really important. And that is unexplained weight gain. So people who are sleep deprived or have sleep apnea are more likely to gain weight than people who are not sleep deprived. And there's several reasons for this, several reasons for this. Um, the first is that we know that sleep deprivation really disrupts the balance of two hormones that regulate your hunger. So these hormones are called leptin and gerilin. Um, one of these hormones makes you feel hungry and one of these hormones makes you feel full and satiated. So what we found is that people who are sleep deprived don't get the signals they need to feel full or satiated. So even if you've had a meal, you may not feel full. The other thing that happens is that people who are chronically sleep deprived have a tendency to reach for higher um, calorie foods. So they re reach for more carbohydrates and they also reach for more fatty foods. And scientists theorize that the reason for this is because sleep deprivation puts your body into survival mode 
And one of the most common things that happens when our body goes into survival mode is we try to get as many calories into our system as possible. So you're probably more likely to reach for high fat, high calorie foods. You're not gonna feel as full as easily. And then the other interesting thing that sleep deprivation does to the body is it changes the way we metabolize food. So it makes our metabolism less efficient at using calories and burning calories. There was a really famous scientific study a few years ago that took two large groups of people. One group of people um, had normal sleep and the other group of people were sleep deprived for a really long period of time. Now, both groups of people ate the same exact meals. They had the same calories, they had the same portions, everything was the same. However, the group that was sleep deprived ended up gaining significantly more weight than the group that wasn't sleep deprived. So these combination of factors can mean that if you have sleep apnea, and because sleep apnea essentially is causing chronic sleep deprivation, you are more likely to gain weight and you're also more likely to gain weight without changing your diet. One of the benefits of going on sleep apnea therapies is for most people, you will find that you may lose a bit of weight when you start you know, breathing properly at night and getting high quality sleep. And so, you know, if you find that you've gained five pounds, 10 pounds, or you're just stacking on weight, no matter how much you exercise, no matter how well you're eating, it's probably going to be beneficial to look into whether or not you're having some sleep issues. Okay, so those are common sleep apnea symptoms obvious ones that most people know about, not so obvious ones. So just a quick review, obvious symptoms would be excessive daytime sleepiness. Two would be gasping for air or feeling like you need to catch your breath. Three is sore throat, dry mouth. Four is snoring. And five is morning headache. Our not so obvious symptoms include increased nighttime urination, insomnia, high blood pressure, mouth or oral hygiene issues, poor mental health, and unexplained weight gain. So we're basically finished and you know I'm happy to answer any questions you have about sleep apnea um, or you can just leave a comment. I'm gonna go ahead and link to uh, Wesper so you can go get some more information if you're interested in screening for sleep apnea or other sleep issues. Um, so I'll add that link below. So I really appreciate everyone who has joined today. This is our first Facebook live stream. So it's a little bit of an experiment for me to see what works and what doesn't. Previously, I've only done Instagram live streams. Um, we are planning on doing these live streams once a week. So if you're interested in learning about a specific topic, um, you know, it can be related to sleep apnea, that's fine. But I also cover all sorts of sleep disorders, sleep science, neuroscience. So anything you're interested in, um, feel free to join our page uh, for updates and leave comments as well. Okay. I'll just wait a minute in case anyone has any additional questions. Feel free to write them in the comment section. You've learned more tonight. Well, that's good. I'm, I'm glad you guys learned something. Um, it's my absolute passion to educate people about sleep and help them get the sleep they need. Um, unfortunately, sleep apnea is an epidemic in our country. Um, it's projected to get worse as time goes on. So the percentage of people who do go on to get diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea increases every year. Um, this isn't just in America, this is a worldwide issue. Uh, so the more we can educate the public, the more aware they'll be, and the more likely they'll be to go and get the diagnosis they need and the treatment they need. Okay, well, I think I'm going to end this session today. Uh, please join us next week. We'll post about the topic um, closer to the date. Thank you so much, and I'll see you guys soon.